Hey everyone, I am Magical Hacker, and this is episode number 12 of the Eminence Podcast, the non-CEDH Commander Podcast where I help you in the command zone with your deck building skills, and on the battlefield with your deck piloting skills. This podcast is brought to you by D Many and the rest of my patrons at patreon.com slash magicalhacker. Today's topic is the question, can I build a commander deck that is good in multiplayer and 1v1? And an alternative title for today's topic here is the Wizard's Riddle. I've mentioned this before in previous videos on my YouTube channel, uh, but I really want to go in depth uh, about that today, and I really think it's going to be super helpful. So let's start off talking about what's the difference between 1v1 and multiplayer from the very bottom, right? We're just going to start with the very basics. In a 1v1 game, it's you playing, you have one opponent, everything that you do is a net negative for your opponent if you're playing the deck if you're playing a game and a deck that's working correctly but everything that your deck is doing every decision you make is moving you closer to winning the game and putting your opponent farther from winning the game and so the two of you are, are each kind of balancing your uh, decisions and whoever can get more advantages eventually will win the game. And sometimes one advantage can be so huge that even if you have a 1% possibility to win the game, you win the game at that point. It becomes 100% because you were able to swing the game in your favor from 1% all the way to 100%. You made a play that increased your win percentage by 99% in that game. right? And so 1v1, everything you do will be hurting your one opponent. Everything your opponent will do will be hurting you until eventually somebody gets to 100%. And once they hit 100%, that's it. The game is over. Um, if the game is still going on, it's not 100% yet, right? There's still a, a chance. So at most in the games, it can be 99.999 whatever percentage. But once it hits 100%, that's when the game is over. That's why it's 100%. Okay. So that's the difference between 1v1, or that's what 1v1 is. In multiplayer, there's a, there's a very different scenario here. Even when you're playing just a game with three players, which is typically not the case. Typically, you'll be playing a game with four players. But even a game with three players, each one of your moves is unlikely to be affecting both of your two opponents equally. Meaning, if I make a play that's helping me win, it's very unlikely that it's going to be affecting my two opponents the exact same amount. Almost everything that I do is going to be worse for somebody than for somebody else. If I'm playing a, uh, a deck that has a lot of creatures that are attacking, it's going to be worse for an opponent who is less able to block those creatures than for an opponent who's not. Or it's going to be worse for an opponent who is more threatening, and so they are going to typically get attacked more than that other opponent. So it's very, very uh, rare for every de any decision I make to affect somebody, uh, to affect multiple opponents the same amount. And that's what happens in multiplayer, which means not only can sometimes uh, there be situations where I reduce one opponent, let's say their win percentage gets decreased by 2% and another person gets decreased by 1%, and so relative to the table, the player who's being affected by 1% isn't going to devote the resources to taking care of what I'm doing if they're playing correctly because they know that the person who has the 2% loss of win percentage is more responsible, is more interested in removing what I'm doing, right? So there's, there's that element of it. Um, but there's also situations where I will make a play It'll reduce one opponent's win percentage by, let's say, 5%. And then another person, it actually increases their win percentage by 1%. So in that situation, one person's lost 5%, another person's gained 1%, and let's say I've gained 4%, because that's what would make the math work out. Certainly a great play, but it doesn't mean that it's bad just because it helped one player. That's something that uh, is an important thing to consider. So that's a difference, right? In a uh, 1v1 game, any decision that I make that helps an opponent at all, by definition, means I'm hurting my own chances to win. In multiplayer, that's not necessarily the case. I can help myself a lot, help an opponent a little, and then hurt my other opponent or other opponents. You know, typically it's four players in a game of Commander. I can hurt them more, and so that balances things out and makes it a good play, in spite of the fact that, yes, I am helping an opponent. 
So that's the difference between 1v1 and multiplayer just from a very basic foundational perspective. That's not even putting into a, uh, taking into account the fact that each player is making decisions, right? It's not, I'm not playing against uh, a machine or and maybe a machine is the wrong word to use because AI can, can certainly be as smart or smarter than humans in, in many situations. But I'm not playing against a um, an algorithm, right? Do this, then do that, then do this, then do that. Everything that players do is in response to what other players are doing. It's a constant dance back and forth. I make a move because of my move. You make a move. Because of your move, then I decide how I make my move, right? It's, it's very similar to a game of chess where the pieces that I move are heavily dependent on what your pieces you move. You influence what I do. Um, and that happens a lot in multiplayer. I would say even more so than 1v1. Um, in 1v1, you only have one opponent. If they're not playing a deck that's interacting with your deck and and, and removing your cards, countering your spells, uh, making you discard cards from your hand, that kind of stuff, then if you can just be faster than them, then you win, right? And that, that means that what their decisions are don't matter to you. You're just you're playing your game plan and you're just trying to to execute it as quickly as possible with the idea that there's nothing that's stopping you so you just got to go as quick as you can. Um, in uh, multiplayer though, that's not necessarily the case because it's very unlikely you'll have three opponents who are all not interacting with you. And I'm sure there's some playgroups out there who, who are like that, but it's beside the point. So that I think is one of the differences, but if we go another layer, we can talk about how players are responding to things. They will look at their three opponents and decide which of my three opponents is the most likely to win. And so therefore I've got to devote the most resources to making sure they don't get to 100%. Otherwise I lose the game. And that's what I've got to do because of that. Now it becomes the best decision to not be that player that people are going to be devoting resources to taking out. And that's exactly where the wizard's riddle comes into play. There was a video I watched. It was one of those uh, TED Talk style videos, but it wasn't a TED Talk itself. It was made by that same YouTube channel. Um, but it was one of those animated cartoons where they go through a, a particular concept. And this one was in the realm of game theory. And it's called the wizard's riddle. I've taken the the video and I've kind of condensed it down or, or or rephrased it so that I can I can read the whole thing out here which I haven't done in a previous video so I can I can really talk about it and we can all be on the same page so let me go ahead and start reading off what happens in this video works like this you have been selected as the champion to represent your wizard house in a duel against two rival magic schools the Nudis school and the Liebton school your first opponent is a sorcerer from the Nudis school who can turn people into fishes using his wand with 70% effectiveness. Your second opponent is an enchantress from the Liebton school who can turn people into statues using her wand with 90% effectiveness. The duel has a specific order of casting starting with you, followed by the sorcerer, then the enchantress. Any participant who casts out of order will receive a penalty, and if everyone stands at the end of round one, everyone will turn into cats. This is to avoid draws. Targeting two opponents at the same time, similarly, is not allowed. As the first one to cast, you are given three options for wands. The banneker, which binds the target with vines, only has 60% effectiveness. The Gaussian, which turns the target into a tree, has 80% effectiveness, and the Noether 9000, the premier wand out of these three, banishes the target on top of a mountain, and it has 100% effectiveness. So, which wand do you choose? That's the riddle. Which one should you go for? The Noether 9000 might seem like the obvious choice, but think about it. It will make you the most powerful target, and the other two magicians will likely team up against you. If you take out the Enchantress first, who has the 90% effectiveness, there's a 70% chance that the Sorcerer will turn you into a fish. 30% chance you'll win. Choosing the Gaussian with 80% effectiveness 
is also kind of risky because even if you successfully take out the sorcerer or the enchantress, they'll still have that same result of turning you into a statue of fish. However, if you don't effectively t take one of them out, then they might view the other person as the highest target. So in that way, purposely missing the shot could prompt the sorcerer to attack the enchantress, now giving you an 80% chance of winning. However, the best option is the banneker. It has 60% effectiveness. And if you miss the shot, the sorcerer will have to take out the enchantress, giving you a 60% chance of winning. If the sorcerer fails, the enchantress will likely turn to the wizard, the next powerful contender, into a statue, giving you another 60% chance of winning. Although the probability is not high, it's still your best shot. So let me go ahead and summarize everything for you one more time. If you pick the 100% effectiveness wand, you will eliminate the wizard with a 90% effective wand and then lose 70% of the time because the remaining wizard will win that much. You'll win 30% and lose 70% of the time. The complete opposite strategy of this is choosing the 60% effective wand and purposely missing your first shot. That means that the wizard with a 70% effective wand will have to choose do they get rid of the person who has a 90% effective wand or you who has a 60% effective wand. If they decide to also purposely miss the shot, then the 90% effective, uh, uh, the, the wizard with a 90% effective wand will be forced into trying to get rid of one of you. Remember, if it starts, if it ends in a draw, all of you will lose. And so you can't have the all three players miss on the first round. So that 90% uh, effective wizard will have to choose who to target. And they either target you with a 60% wand or the other wizard with a 70% wand. So they'll definitely choose that person. So in that situation, the 70% wizard does not want to be missing their first shot as well, just like you did. So they will be trying to take out the 90% effective person. So in 70% of the time, they'll do that. And so then it'll come to you. You'll have a 60% chance of winning. If you do the math, that at least just in that one situation where they effectively hit the uh, wizard and you... Uh, uh, effectively hit them, uh, hit them. you'll win the game 42% of the time. That's already higher than the 30% we talked about with the 100% wand. So no matter which way you slice it, again, we didn't even do the full math, it's still already higher. Just from that one scenario that's going to happen a certain percentage of the time, we can calculate that at least 42% of the time you're going to be winning the game by going with the not-so-obvious choice. The reason I like this one is it because it explains, due to game theory, due to the fact that people are making decisions based on how threatening you look, um, it's much smarter to uh, spend resources, and I'll explain what I mean by that, spend resources, it's much better to spend resources to make sure your opponents are spending resources on each other. Not only does that mean that your opponents are being hindered because of the answers that are being thrown their way, they're also having to use up answers from their hand. And of course, you'll have to use answers from your hand too, because if you're not having that spot removal, then in the most extreme scenario, nobody has spot removal. And so it doesn't matter if you look threatening or not, you know, because nobody's going to be stopping anything that you're doing. So having some answers is important. If you're going up against a lot of uh, decks that have combat as their win condition, Board wipes is what uh, is what that entails. If you're going up against a lot of opponents who have combos as their finishers, then you want to have spot removal or counter spells. And so those are the two things. Now, if you're not playing in a in a meta game where combos typically kill you, then you might not the you know find a need for a spot removal, which is I think where the um, Commander Clash crew from MTG Goldfish is, and that's why which, uh, Richard seems to to play a, without playing any spot removal spells. So I kind of a little side note there. But if you're in a, a meta game where both of those are, even if it's not equally likely, but both of them are present, you want to be able to have a little bit of, of each of those two. Just be able to hedge your bets so that you can uh, kind of sneak your, your win in there. So how do we apply this from the Wizard's Riddle, which is certainly similar, but in many ways very different from Magic? 
how do we apply that to Commander? So here's a couple of things that I think we should think about. If we want to win the game, we have to make sure that we have some type of combination of cards or interactions of cards within our own deck that allow us to win the game. There's not one card that by itself, and you do nothing else, that one card by itself will win you the game. Um, every card you know, kind of relies on other cards together. Even an infinite combo requires multiple cards. So one card by itself winning you the game isn't necessarily the, the, a, a likely scenario or a realistic idea. There's other things that you've got to do in order to get to that point. So your deck, you're wanting to combine cards together in order to get to that win. Because of that, opponents are going to be trying to prevent you from winning. So you've got to try to figure out a way, how can I do my thing? How do I, how do I win the game in a way where the minimal amount of answers are sent my way? And I think there's a couple of things you can do. Number one, you've got to try to avoid being the threat at the early game. And number two, you have to try to be very explosive in the late game. Those are the two things you want to combine together. Without both of those, I don't think it's as easy to win compared to when you do have both of those, right? If you're if you're not a threat at the early game, but you're also not explosive in the late game, then what you have is just a, a slow deck that's not doing anything. It's not doing a whole lot, and so the wins are not as easy. And I've I've built plenty of decks like this. Trust me, it, it's it comes up a lot more often than you would think. Where trying to go for this strategy, sometimes you you go too far, and now you have a deck that doesn't do enough. Um, one example of this, I guess, real quick, because it's 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 fun to talk about examples. I had a deck where I was trying to uh, mill cards uh, from myself. It was a jund colored deck, so realistically speaking, it wasn't very effective at milling a bunch of cards. But I was trying to mill myself with that jund colored deck get a lot of creatures into the graveyard, a lot of lands, a lot of whatever, my whole deck, and then I would play creatures that would scale up their power and toughness with the number of particular cards in graveyards. And usually with this, it was also trying to mill opponents as well, although in Jund, you don't really get a whole lot of options for that outside of Mesmeric Orb. Um, but we were, you know, I was trying to, to mill everybody, including myself, and then that way I would have... Uh, lots of cards in graveyards and I could use a card that would get a power and toughness increase from the number of cards in decks so for example I might be playing something like Lord of Extinction it's just power and toughness equal to the total number of cards in all graveyards so I would play something like that and then I would follow it up with uh, certain types of fling spells so spells similar to the card fling but that were effective at hitting each opponent so the two cards that are really you know, four uh, it, that come to mind really quickly are Chandra's Ignition and Gerard Golgari Lichlord. And so those are the two that I was thinking of that would allow me to turn this really big creature into just a massive output of damage. Now, since then, that deck has been changed into a Grixis style deck that's more effective at milling myself. And instead of trying to get one big creature, I'm trying to reanimate all creatures, and all those creatures have ETBs that deal damage to my opponents. That's my Cormella deck. Um, so it's certainly very different now, but the reason I took that part, uh, took apart that deck and, and changed it into something totally different um, is because I found often that I was spinning my wheels and not closing out the game. It was so, so hard. I wasn't a threat early on. What's this guy doing? He's just milling? Pfft, what, who cares, right? Um, but at the, at the same time, I wasn't explosive in the late game. Every now and then, I was able to, to do my game plan, um, but it was very few and far between. So that's an example of when you are not threatening in the early game, but you're also not explosive in the late game. Now, if you're explosive in the late game, but you're also threatening in the early game, that's a big problem too. This reminds me of uh, kind of the classic build of an Infect deck. This is typically the, the problem here. Um, Infect is very explosive at all stages in the game, early game and late game. And because of that, it's very threatening in the early game. A lot of uh, tables will see that any person who's playing an Infect deck and being explosive in the early game will result in three opponents trying to team up to take them out. And that's really a bad situation. You don't want to be the arch enemy at the table until you're about to win. And in the early game, it's really tough to be about to win as you're being the arch enemy. Not only because you don't have that much 
ramp out. You don't have that many you know cards in hand. You haven't really developed a card draw at this point. There hasn't really been a whole lot of board wipes that allow you to get ahead of your opponents. But not only that, you also have three opponents who just started the game. They probably have spot removal or board wipes in their hand. Very effective at being able to take you out. They're not low in cards in hand like they would be in the late game. So those two things you want to have. You want to have non-threatening in the beginning and explosive in the end. So those two are both very, very important. So here's a takeaway message. In multiplayer, the best wand is the 60% wand while you're missing your first shot. And the best deck is the deck that is less threatening as the other players and it isn't doing something scary at the start of the game. This is in contrast to what happens in 1v1 where the best wand is the 100% wand because you will be able to win 100% of the time. The best deck is the deck that is super fast and super scary. So can you have a deck that is both good in 1v1 and in multiplayer? I would say it's either no or it's very, very tough, very difficult, very, I would say it's on the realm of impossible. I can't think of an example off the top of my head that would make it possible, but I would say, yeah, probably not. So let me talk a little bit about a, a recent story. Um, there is a content creator by the name of Tribal Kai, really like his videos, and I saw that he was hosting a game on Magic Online the other day, so I joined that game, but it was a 1v1 game, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to be talking about this uh, in an episode soon. Let me try it out. Let me play one of my decks that I know is is great in, in multiplayer and see how, it's, how it fares in a 1v1 game. As you can imagine, it was horrible. I got steamrolled with that deck. And I had even kept a, a pretty good hand. So uh, Tribal Kai in that game was playing a uh, Skelv, Skelv? can't remember how, how, how it's spelled, but that uh, one drop white, mono white uh, commander that is essentially a mother of runes for another creature, but you also get to give that creature toxic one. And the card itself also has toxic one. And I was playing that deck. That deck was really good, uh, especially in 1v1. I had even had a chance where I could use a board wipe. My commander was only three mana, and so I was able to, uh, you know, set it out for some blocks as well. But even in that situation, I still died. I think it was like turn four, because um, I just had gotten 10 infect counters or 10 poison counters and, and had lost the game. But it goes to show that a deck that's really set and, and designed to be very effective in multiplayer. By definition, I would say, it's not going to be very good in 1v1. The inverse is also true. A deck that's designed to be very effective and powerful in a 1v1 format is, by definition, going to be pretty poor in multiplayer. Not only do your early turns cause you to uh, become the threat or not become the threat, your commander, I think, is probably the first step in that direction. So playing a scary commander... You know, even before people get to even keep their hands. You have no idea how many cards somebody has in their hand. You already see their commander, so you can already make a judgment about who the threat at the table is. And so because of that, I think there are some things that we can keep in mind. Trying to build a deck designed to win in multiplayer, you, you really have to think about what's the easiest way for me to win? What's going to be the smartest strategy? Um, and not necessarily everybody plays that way. Some people don't mind losing and they prefer to be the arch enemy they you know there's all these things that they like to do but if you're like me you don't like being the arch enemy at the table you don't like um losing you know the game because you're you had a really good start um then you know that's not going to be the the smartest strategy try to go for a commander that's not threatening try to uh sacrifice the early game momentum for the late game explosiveness um and that will help you win the game i think more often than not that's my take. If you disagree or if you have any questions, please, please leave me a comment at youtube.com slash magicalhackermtg or a tweet at twitter.com slash magical underscore underscore hacker. Speaking of which, let's take a look at some of the questions that you all left for me. So uh, on episode two, titled, How Can You Build an Animar Deck at Power Level 6 or 7? Breffin wrote, Offhand, an Animar-based wincon in the 99 sounds like a recipe for feel bads, but I like the idea of setting goals. Like, I want to beat you up with colored creatures around turn 6, if uninterrupted. So, in a way, I, I understand where, where Breffin's coming from. Um, having Animar in the 99, it is hiding your uh, power 
I think that's effective though, and I think every deck does that. I don't necessarily see it being a recipe for feel bads, um, simply because I don't think you can have a feel bad in a situation like that and be okay with every other deck. Almost every deck in the format is trying to um, either hide their power in their deck or they're just not as good as that. So um, I don't think that's necessarily a recipe for feel bads. I would be surprised if someone said, I don't like the fact that you you won using an Animar based win con in your 99 because at that point, I would say, well, would you have been against it if Animar was my commander? And I think that's an important question to ask as well. Because if they say yes, um, then the question is, you know, was there a miscommunication at the start of the game of what's okay? But then if they say no, it, it wouldn't have been bad in the, as if Animar was the commander, then that just means that they want to be 100% aware of what your deck is doing, which I think is an unnecessary advantage that you that you should be you know expecting in a game. I don't think people should expect. I want to know everything that my opponents are doing 100%. I think part of the the reason the game is so interesting is because you might have that 90% effectiveness wand, but because it looks like a 40% effectiveness wand, you get an edge there. And I think that's part of the game. I think uh, otherwise everybody just plays something really scary and you know nobody's the threat because Everybody knows what everybody's doing. and it, To me, that just makes the game so much more boring. Um, I probably wouldn't be playing Commander if that was the, the way you had to play. So that's my that's my opinion. Uh, and then, yes, setting goals is great. I think that's also a really good way to, to build a deck where if you aren't trying to be super fast, then build your deck in a way where it's not super fast. And I think that's even, the, like I said in today's episode, I think that's the smarter way to play. Uh, let's do one more. On episode three, titled, Are Two Mana Draw Twos? Good and Commander, Breffin, same same person here, uh, wrote, I don't play a lot of the little draw twos, and when I do, they're most likely gathered into the same deck. For instance, my primary 33 land ramp deck has a lot of little card draws alongside the ramp spells. Why? Because the deck has payoffs for just plain having a density of spells. I need multiple spells to flip Primal Amulet, or really trigger Tide, Sp- uh, Tide Spout Tyrant and Gutter Snipe, other places are like Vedrock, which is also highly spell-focused. The other instance being ways to spend mana that would otherwise go unused. For instance, if I hold up mana for a counterspell and then don't need it, so I want to spend my mana elsewhere. Time for vision schemes. I'm not having six open mana consistently. I'm having one play first, then only ever two to three mana left behind. There are definitely a sometimes thing or a filler thing. Some decks more than others, for instance Aetherworks Marvel, need a certain, certain density of impactful cards. But in a pinch, a player could effectively shrink their deck by using the two drops. Not in place of dedicated card draw, but definitely plays that can be mi- mixed among other cards in order to just see more of their deck. I think this is a great addition to what I had talked about in that episode. Um, with everything that I, I mention, I try to add on the disclaimer that every card that I say is not good in Commander, it is good if you're theme is based around that as long as your theme is not like you know i want to be the archman enemy at the table that might not be the smartest way to play but if that's what you have fun with then go for it you know if you have fun playing the the draw twos even if you were presented let's say uh with absolute certainty that it was causing you to lose games because that's what you're playing if you still would want to play those draw twos then by all means go ahead i think the the difference is when people look at those cards and then they try to teach others that these cards are so good that everybody should be playing them as much as possible in their commander decks because of how good they are, then I think I have a little bit of a a disagreement there, and I think I would want to try to rephrase that perspective. So are the the draw twos bad in every situation? No, I don't think so. Um, But are they also good in every situation? Again, I don't think that's the case here either. Whereas some people would say yes. So that was kind of the main uh, point of the of the of the topic there. But I love Breffin's addition here that there are some examples of decks that would love to have these cards. If you're trying to do a lot of things, then that might be the better idea. Let me give you an example of something from my own uh, previous, I guess you could say, repertoire of decks that allowed me to be in a similar situation. I had a Seer Kara deck. It's a mono red commander. And it has an ability that says something like, whenever Seer Kara or an instant or sorcery spell 
deals damage to an opponent. You exile the top card of your library. You may cast that spell this turn. Um, and it also has an ability where you can tap it to deal one damage to any target. And so I had built that deck as like a mono red storm deck using cards like Earthquake, which uh, Earthquake is a sorcery, costs X and a red. And it says it deals X damage to each creature without flying and each player. So if I paid just one mana for that X, so it's a two drop spell, I would deal one damage to each player. That would trigger Seer Kira three times. So I'd exile the top three cards of my library and be able to cast those spells that turn. So in combination with Rituals, which are probably the most prevalent in red nowadays, um, and ways to copy spells, also a big thing in red, and ways to close out the game like uh, Gutter Snipe or uh, Grape Shot, also cards that are in red. I was able to build a Storm deck in Mono Red that was very effective. And yeah, if you look in that situation, I am playing what I had considered bad cards where I'm paying two mana for something that you know technically draws me three, which is nice. But if one player dies or one player concedes, then it's only drawing me two cards. Is that still good? I would say, yeah, I still think that's pretty good. And so uh, there are certain decks that will be wanting to play two mana draw twos. I even have a deck in this example that is exactly that. I would like to play those two mana draw twos. Uh, it's a storm deck and it, le- it needs that, like Breffin said, that density of spells to be casting each turn. Cheap things that allow me to keep going and draw two mana draw twos really fit that bill very, very easily. Primal Amulet, I think, is is a great example. If you have that in your deck and you really want to flip it as quickly as possible, yeah, the two mana draw twos, in addition to nine or eight uh, pieces of card draw, might be the way to go. So that's, I think, something that you can think about. That is all the time that we have today for answering questions. If you want to pick the topic for an episode of the Eminence podcast, check out patreon.com slash magical hacker. In fact, the question for the next episode will be, how do you pare down a collection that has gotten too big? So make sure to subscribe on YouTube or follow on Spotify if you want to get notified of that episode and other episodes when they come out. Thank you again to d Thank you to all of my patrons. And thank you for listening. Stay awesome, everybody. Mm-hmm.